seven, wait, hold on. Eight minutes, eight minutes late. I call this one. Live broadcasts have technical hurdles. Raise your hand if you can't hear me out there. I just want to make sure we are broadcasting. Laura, are we broadcasting? We're live, we're live. I feel like that guy who's who was this thing on. Hey, look, really sorry. We had some minor technical glitches because that never happens in the world of live television, which is what we're doing today, live TV. And I'm super excited about it. So we got, I think, a really fun show today. We're going to be talking about live production and basically how to do it remote because let's face it that's what we're all dealing with right now is live production uh, in the real world so hold on let's make sure we got our screen up and we are broadcasting out okay so a couple things we're gonna do today we've got a little slideshow if i can get it to show up on screen ah there it is let's uh bring that up told you guys it's going to be more fun if you watch this live because then you'll see me make mistakes which is happening as we speak okay so as always uh if you have questions chat them out uh we will try and answer them as it happens uh if you have questions after the show call us we're happy to get on the phone with you and work those through um and then you know today again here just to talk about the agenda and kind of what we're doing um, wrong keyboard nicholas so today we are going to plug on uh, Remy production. So what is Remy production? Um, and really what this, what we're talking about is remote, ooh, there it comes, remote editorial, um, remote integration. You know, what is Remy? Right, hold on, we're gonna go back a slide. There it is. Okay, today's agenda. Remy production and remote editorial review. That's kind of the highlight reel today. Now, before we go there, we should also say today's uh, nerd shirt is brought to you by Spider-Man, uh, creator of the World Wide Web. Um, if you don't believe it, look it up on the internet. And without the World Wide Web, I think we'd all be visiting the most essential business of all, which would be Blockbuster, right? Because we'd all need to have something to do with our kids right now. Okay, here we go. Remote production and remote editorial review. So let's figure out first, what is remote production? All right, so for that, let's go to something a little bigger on the screen. There we are. Okay, so Remy, remote integration, standing for remote integration of cameras and servers and play out all things at a distance, right? So, and then it was kind of defined originally around at-home sports production. Um, so, which is kind of uh, poignant for right now because most sports production is being done from uh, people's homes at the moment. Um, so it was about the ability to, you know, bring content from a field or from a, a distant location and bring it back to the main facility where then we could produce it in our own facility um, via these remote feeds. Now, in terms of what this looks like, right? I mean, let's let's break it down. A, a stadium up afar, you know, maybe we're we're going to run a truck out to that stadium, throw down cameras, produce a show, and back haul it back into the truck, and then that truck is going to broadcast that back to a main facility, a TV station, a broadcast facility, and then broadcast it out to the world. However, when you have to roll a truck, a truck is expensive. A truck has a big crew. A truck has a lot of gear, and it means that you have less ability to deal with uh, internet failures like this morning um, because you only have the gear that's available to you unlike if you were working at your own home facility where you have backups upon backups right well so what if we were to take the truck out of the mix and just send the cameras and effectively that is remy production only sending the necessary gear to broadcast a live camera feed and interview or remote production back to the tv station where we can use the switchers we have there to produce the show and broadcast it out this also allows us to bring cameras from different fields from different stadiums and produce a larger show the most common use of this right now is esports if you look at some of the large esports tournaments they're pulling from multiple stadiums or multiple players all over the world wide web bringing those into one production and then broadcasting that production out um, however this doesn't have to be about a stadium this would absolutely be about live interviews, live events, things that are happening inside of the corporate world, right? Um, I'm talking to friends with tech companies right now that are saying, hey, we're, we're bringing in our CEOs, we're bringing in people and utilizing Zooms and Skypes and all these tools to bring them into a facility that has a switcher where we can switch them live and do the type of thing we're doing right now. 
So if that's the case, great, this moves beyond at-home sports production. So we're gonna talk a little bit about some technologies today that make that better. In addition to that, we're gonna talk about REM-E, I'm calling this one myself, remote editorial viewing, right? And this is the, when, when we really start to look at the at-home newscaster specials, I'm dubbing it today. When we look at remote production, right now, if I'm a producing a commercial for a client and I'm getting the edit done, I've got my tracks laid out, at some point, I need that client to view it, right? And if that client's not in my backyard where they can walk across the fence, then we have to find a way to share that with them. Most often, we see people export that to a file, upload it to YouTube, create a private virtual link, do it on Vimeo, and publish it out to their client, but that's not real time. Right? Because then you have to wait for the upload, wait for the transcode, wait for the client to view it when you could actually just bring them into the edit in real time and let them communicate with you the changes they want made or how much they love it. Now, I'm calling this my at-home newscaster special because if you watch all these newscasters that are working from home right now, the number one problem they have is getting a feed from the station. They need to be able to view what the station is talking about, the video that's being played out, the weather map, right? And so with this same tool that we're gonna to showcase today, we can produce a stream back out to that newscaster at home where they can watch, comment, and then push that back live, right? And now ordinarily this would look the same, right? We got a TV station, but instead of pulling from the stadium, we're now pushing out. So we're gonna push a feed from Premiere, from Avid, from whatever application you're wanting to use or live video playout server into a tablet, a phone, some um, desktop device, it doesn't matter. As long as it's a um, got a CPU and can load software, then we can view this stream. And this just makes life that much easier. Okay, so as all, so in order to do this today, we're you know the REM E and the REM I, we've got a host in with us today, um, Mr. Daniel Lundstrett from Intenor. He is the regional sales manager. He should be up on your screens now. Let me make sure you're seeing him. Um, and if that's the case, then you know, we're gonna have a live guest. So Daniel, uh, I think you've got some things you wanna share with us. If you would go ahead and take over um, and let's get this Hi. presentation started. Sure, thanks. Thanks for the uh, the presentation and you almost managed to, to uh, get my name right, but we'll, we'll work on that. Next Look, time. it took me a year to learn how to say Intenor, so let's, yeah. let's, let's, it's going to take exactly. me time to learn that one. <laughs> a big hurdle just to, to understand the spelling of everything, but uh, we'll try to get there. Uh, and uh, yeah, um, so I'm Daniel uh, from Intenor, um, and uh, I uh, thought I would start with a small presentation about about us, who we are and, and what we are doing. Um, so uh, now it's my time to, to have the technical issues, but we'll see if I manage. Uh, oh, so I here we go. Uh, now I think my presentation is, is up. Uh, you are up and running, absolutely. I'm up and running, good. Um, okay, so Intinor started in 2003 by uh, Roland Axelsson. He's still the, the majority owner and, uh, and CEO and product manager of the company. Uh, it's a family owned and uh, also a lot of the uh, employees is, uh, is partly owned uh, owners of, of this, this company. Uh, HQ development, production, and everything uh, up here in northern Sweden. Uh, we work with direct sales here in the Nordics, uh, but um, we have resellers ac across Europe and uh, our exclusive distributor in the US, uh, which is JBNA. Um, over 1,000 units shipped, and uh, most of them are actually still in use. Uh, we have one unit that have been up and running for eight years. We actually had cake for it a couple of uh, weeks ago. Uh, um, our goal and our, our vision is to provide the, the best and most comprehensive solution for, for high quality live video over the internet. So that's what we're going to try to, to uh, talk more about today. So some of the references um, you can see here. Um, we, uh, we've actually been working with eSports for, for quite some time. Uh, Dreamhack is originally Swedish uh, still. Uh, so we've been working with them for five or six years. Um, we uh, signed up with ESL just last year 
uh, Blast Pro Series and other major esports companies. Uh, uh, Lodge there, NEP, Comcast, uh, SES, uh, and uh, Triathlon. So a lot of different uh, customers in, in different vertical markets, but that's what we aim for. We aim to have the, the best and most comprehensive solution. So we need to have solutions for, for every vertical market. Um, the product series is based on three different products. It's the direct link, that's our encoder. So SDI or NDI inputs, software encoders, a lot of cool features, uh, and then you're sending your stream over public internet. Um, we have our direct receiver, um, simple uh, receiver, IP inputs, can receive different formats, uh, TCP, UDP, you name it, and output that on SDI, uh, four-way talkback and so on. Uh, then we come to the direct router, uh, which we're gonna talk a lot about today. Uh, we like to call it the Swedish army knife, um, IP inputs to receive like I said, um, TCP, UDP, SRT, uh, but also net video inputs to receive uh, um, RTMP, receive uh, RTSP, SRT poll, uh, and, and many more. Uh, uh, SDI, NDI inputs and outputs, software encoders, um, router panel, video mixer, well, a lot of different features. Uh, and um, to have the best possible solution for for point-to-point -point transport over public internet, we actually created our own proprietary protocol uh, called Bifrost. So uh, Bifrost has error correction, both forward error correction and ARQ. It has network bonding, so fixed internet, 3G, 4G. Uh, we've run some 5G tests as well. Uh, Wi-Fi, KASAT, whatever you, whatever kind of network connection you have, uh, adaptive bitrate, resolution, redundant audio, cost management to make sure that you don't waste uh, on uh, costly <laughs> internet connection. If you have a very expensive uh, 4G network or uh, a satellite that you're paying a lot of money for, uh, you don't want to use that too much. Uh, low latency. Um, we are adding more and more uh, sub uh, 0 0.5 second low latency receiver bonding, bonding for other data. Yeah, so we're working on that all the time. Um, we've also actually created a, a partner for Bifrost. It's called Heimdall. So this is a rack-based system with uh, 4G modems in it, uh, two, four, or eight modems. So. Uh, we have one customer traveling all around the world uh, and uh, using uh, Heimdall together with the fixed internet that they are always getting at the stadiums. Uh, so then they have Heimdall for their uh, backup. So even though they get a bad internet connection like we had this morning, uh, we have 4G as backup. So Remy, um, we're going to talk about this, but uh, I want to highlight some features. Uh, we're going to look in the, into the web interface and we're going to see how this actually works. But um, a couple of features that I want to talk about. Uh, multiple software encoders on your, uh, your direct link or your encoder, being able to send multiple streams from each unit. Um, so direct link and direct routers can have multiple software encoders and each uh, software encoder can have multiple destinations so this op op open up a lot of different uh, possibilities uh, we have network bonding like we talked about bifrost or brt we have return video uh, over hdmi sdi or ndi uh, interoperability uh, we like to talk about this because we don't. We have a lot of customers that are working with different partners, and they want to receive from different companies, especially in these days when um, you have production companies out at different facilities, and they want to send in with. We don't really care if they have a live view or if they have a phone or a laptop that they want to send in. Our goal is to to receive that. So interoperability to be able to send and receive between different 
products. Uh, VPN uh, for PTZ, Tally, um, or uh, sending data. For wire talkback and IFB, uh, we have uh, we're going to look at this router panel, video mixer, and multi-view uh, for monitoring or even remote video mixing. Uh, for your MCR, we have a uh, open REST API and uh, uh, also support for VSM or Ember Plus. Oh, looks like we lost him. All right, well, Daniel gets himself fixed on that side. Uh, let's jump into one um, quick piece while he's coming back around. Uh, looks like the internet coming out of Sweden. Wait, he's back. Am I back? <laughs> you are back. Hello and welcome. I think the uh, the stop screen share uh, kind of lost me there. Uh, no worries, no worries. Uh, we, we lost you right at the end of that slide. Was that all you wanted to say on that, or do you, got, do you have more that you want to show on the slide deck? No, I was actually I was actually down there. So um, I thought we could. Uh, I'll jump back to you and uh, let you show the the interface. Fair enough. Fair enough. So a couple of things. So I want to key in on what Daniel was saying is interoperability, being able to grab a source from virtually anybody's encoder. Um, and that's some of what we're going to show today. So to understand kind of the layout for what we've got going today, we have a router and a, a direct link encoder. So we're pulling a couple feeds out of Sweden um, and bringing those into the U.S. They look a little bit like this. So I've got, let's see here, um, you can do a couple different decks here. We've got a side-by-side -side comparison with forward error correction without forward error correction up here in the upper right. You can see that one glitching on the right side because it's got nothing to packet protect itself. On that side, we've got a live stream of the same thing going over their proprietary codec, which is the BRT. So it's much cleaner. It's got the forward error correction. Um, you know, in addition to that, uh, Daniel's pulling off of his phone from the studio. So we're using a phone app to be able to, to scrape uh, right off his phone and bring that in. So lots of different ways to bring content in. Um, actually, I'm sorry, this was the phone side there. Yeah, give us a good wave. Um, lots of different ways to bring content in, and that's kind of what we want to focus on a little bit is, is all the different sources and destinations that you can have. Now, what I like about these encoders is that they're all web-based from the control aspect of it. So no matter where your encoder is, you're able to jump in and have a look at it. And so that sort of starts with ISS, the monitoring side. So let's log in here and look. So this is my demo pool of gear right now. So we've got the um, the encoder that's presenting uh, an encode back to him. We've got the router, which is receiving multiple channels of video coming back to us. And you can see one of them's got um, some issues here, why it's bright red um, along that side. But with Ingenor, we have the ability to look at encoders and decoders and routers, no matter where they are across the pod, right? So we're able to log into them, do a health check, make setting changes, and also pull a feed out of it. And we're gonna talk about how that helps us with um, the editorial side. What's phenomenal is once you get into a router, um, so here in K, actually let's do a little zoom in on this one here so you can see what I'm showing you a little easier. And away we go. So this is actually our IP stream input here that we're monitoring. This is the one coming from overseas. And as you can see, we are getting a little bit of packet loss um, that's happening you know, kind of live on air right now. We get a nice thumbnail preview of what's happening so we can see. We've got these things cut way down because my network is low and I'm pulling five feeds from him simultaneously. Um, we can see we're, we are seeing a fair amount of packet loss, um, and but we've got after the forward error correction, we're, we're not we're seeing that on screen, right? We're able to recover and fix that as we go. Um, now here is a snapshot of everything that's happening in the router. We can see all the different IP streams coming in from his camera. Net video is one we're gonna talk about in a minute and then multi-view. So we can actually generate a multi-view feed from multiple incoming sources into the router and then push that back out, um, you know, as a IP stream, as a local feed, you know, kind of ever we wanna do it. And then more importantly, net video, which Daniel, did you touch on net video yet? Um, <laughs> talking about video over internet. So uh, my connection actually restarted. So. <laughs> I dropped out for a, for a minute there. 
Uh, no worries. We're kind of walking through just some of the basic interface things. Um, and kind of, so we'll, we'll kind of jump into um, net video in a quick second on what that is. Okay, so primarily what we're trying to do with the router here is ease its use. Let me jump to a larger version of the screen so you can see the full interface. This is the web GUI of the router on my side. And as you can see, I can look at all the incoming destinations that I have on it uh, and be able to preview those. I can see the IP streams that are coming into me and then I can see a net video stream. A net video stream is actually a, um, uh, a standard RTMP from anybody's encoder at this point. Um, you know, and, and with net video, we actually generate a, a link and a stream key so you can take existing encoders and make it think we're a CDN and bring it in. So I've got the ability to kind of pulse through all my content here. And then I've got my outputs on my router. This is very traditional uh, baseband router type of feel, right? We've got the ability to, to look at all of our content um, and see thumbnails and route it just like we would any source. I can click on a source, see where destinations it's going and kind of route through these. And then if I want to unlock it, I can change a routing destination and reroute on the fly where that video is going. And I got it set up perfect right now, so I'm not going to touch it for the moment. And then in addition to that, we can even generate our multi-view. Um, so if we see down here, we should see our multi-viewer hiding from us. Let's jump out of that one. So that's the router panel. When I get into my status settings, now I can start to look at every incoming stream that I've got, what its current status is. And as I showed you earlier, we can actually look at, you know, where our forward error correction is helping us and kind of bailing us out of a bad internet connection in this particular case. Now I'm gonna flip the switch here. I'm gonna jump into my encoder. Now what I like about the encoders here is when you traditionally see an encoder is that it, it gives you one destination, one output, right? Where do you wanna send that? But with the internal ones, we actually have the ability of once we choose one of our inputs, we can add multiple encode profiles and multiple destinations to a single encoder, as long as we're using the same encode profile. As long as we're you know, encoding once, we can send it to multiple destinations in multiple types on the way out. So it gives us a lot of flexibility, but it also supports something really unique here, which I like is TCP on request or SRT on request. And with this one, let's do a little zoom in on that so you can see what I'm talking about. It gives us the ability to actually um, create a link that somebody can pull from us. So when we talked earlier about remote editorial viewing or um, even your newscasters being on the fringe needing to be able to pull the feedback, with one router, we can receive feeds from them. And then with the encoder turned on, we can push whatever content we want back to that user over just a VLC or any kind of um, streaming uh, player application. And we can do it with both TCP and SRT. So if you need that security layer, you can use SRT. If you're not worried about it, you can use TCP. But allows us again to create a link, push that out to a client, allow them to pull the feedback. Um, now, and and if I can jump in there at, at destinations, yes. um, also if uh, like uh, our customers, for example, ESL does has a lot of different uh, broadcast partners, uh, they can have just one software encoder and they can offer their customers to receive on uh, TCP or uh, UDP by Frost, our own protocol, if they have customers that are um, that have internal receivers, but they can at the same time with the same encoder, they can um, offer TCP poll and uh, RTMP. So they the flexibility for them to to be able to to offer a lot of different protocols and and ways to actually receive the content is why they they picked Intinor uh, and uh, what is actually creating a good offer for uh, their sales team when they are talking to uh, to broadcasters they want to receive this so it's it's easy for them to to be able to uh, yeah distribute the material because they have a lot of different options yeah and let's just take one of those right now so this bouncing over to a different machine I'm going to um, grab a network stream. So this is that link, that, that URL we were seeing just a second ago. Here's the TCP pull packet, the IP address, and the port. I'm just launching this in VLC. So if I double click this, we're actually going to get, this is a computer that's on and editing right now. So this is a machine that's uh, somewhere. Um, and it's, uh, it's generating a stream. So we're feeding the HDMI port out into an encoder. The encoder is grabbing that, generating a stream for us. 
looks like it's getting a little battery because it's been running for some time now, but allows us in real time on VLC, which is a free app that anybody can download on any device to enter into the conversation and start monitoring the stream. So when we talked about remote editorial or even just remote viewing of content, this is that application stack right here. Using the encoder and the router, we can very easily generate a link that anybody can pull right out of the system provided you give them the correct parameters. Um, so very, very easy system to negotiate there. All right, let's jump back over to the interface side for a minute and we're gonna look at some other stuff. I'm gonna make that VLC feed go away. Okay, now, in addition to, you know, as we talked about being able to control your encoders and routers, here is actually Daniel's, which is in Sweden. So I'm logging into his right now. I've got the ability to monitor every channel. So if I wanna go to his router panel, I can see his router panel. This is a great feature because this is part of that remote production piece, that Remy production where you don't always have a full staff on the far side. You don't always have somebody over there who can fine tune the details or make sure you're getting the right feed. So with the Intonor um, encoder or router at the far side, I'm able to log into it, view all the camera feeds that he's putting in, um, view all the, you know, the sources, verify content, right? And then look at my uh, destinations and ensure that it's going the right direction or even just control it and route it remotely. In fact, if you really want, let me know if I break it on you, Daniel, there is a switcher built right into the application where now I can grab feeds and switch those live. Oh, I gotta turn on, there we go. Switch it live, generate a picture in picture and push that control. So if you've got limited bandwidth on the far side at your, at your production side, and you only have the bandwidth to pull one feedback, you could actually be producing that show live and controlling what it is you're pushing back, right? Which feed you're grabbing and, and pulling out of the field and sending back to the other side. Now, one thing we wanted to talk about in there was, uh, oh wait, I missed it. Where am I at, Daniel? I want to go to... Go to uh, encoder. Yeah, oh yeah, there we go, thank you. Encoder, let's go uh, look at encoder. The other one is just kind of understanding what your bandwidth looks like. So let's have a look at this. So we're gonna get a graph here on the bottom. And I'm gonna zoom in on that so you can see it. Bear with me just a quick second and we'll grab this. And while he's zooming, I, um, right now we're using the fixed internet we have here, and we're also using a 4G modem. So what you will see there is uh, our, uh, bonding over two different paths, uh, and we're also using a net destroyer to add 10% packet loss. So on the feed that, that goes over the pond to, to Nick is um, yeah two different paths, uh, but with 10% packet loss. Yeah, and Daniel didn't want me to show this because we're getting a little degradation on our feed going out, um, but I'm going to do it anyway. But this is just an example of the, you know, the type of delay and the type of error correction you can add. So on the right, you're seeing it without error correction. On the left, you're seeing it with. But of course, we may not be seeing it correctly at all um, from that perspective, uh, just based on our current internet connection. Uh, let's get back out of this. But you've got all that monitoring capability. We can see our feeds coming. And then there's one other very powerful feature that I like a lot. And I'm gonna bring that one in. And this is the ability to manage your data usage, how your data is going out. So if we jump into our system side, we're actually gonna look at data costs. So within this perspective, we can start to align what internet feeds are costing us the most money which things are going to be um, you know, the most costly. So if you're using um, cellular, um, if you're using Wi-Fi, if you're using ethernet, they actually all will apply here. And then we can start to apply a cost to those. How much are they, what, you know, what is our free versions versus our costly ones and align those um, within a profile so that the adaptive encoder will prioritize the free ones. And as it starts to max out its bandwidth, it can adjust and make the changes along the way. Um, to ensure that you know we've got the best internet for the money, and that's always you know very key to this is for the money. Um, Daniel, what else is important that we want to show right now? Um, yeah, you can if you jump back to the uh, the router in uh, Folsom. Yep. And you go to uh, net video input. We can talk a little bit more about that. So uh, net video. 
so net video input is um, HLS poll, RTSP poll, and also uh, NDI input and uh, RTMP uh, ingest, uh, as we call it. So um, uh, looking at right now, I only see myself, but <laughs> uh, we can see if, if Nick uh, can showcase our HLS poll or and then also our RTMP, where RTMP in is actually creating uh, your own little CDN where you create your RTMP uh, URL and your stream key. So you can uh, tell customers that are using OBS, vMix, a phone, uh, whatever, and they can they can send uh, directly to your NetVideo input. Um, yeah. So Nick, maybe you can. I'm not yeah, sure so we're actually, you, we're actually pulling that up on yeah. screen, so we're showing a, you know how we can generate that stream key uh, live. So we uh, are we jump, jumping into our net video inputs. I'm going to choose an RTMP receive. It's going to create a stream name, uh, and you can you know have it generate one, or you can punch in your own. It's going to give you an RTMP address um, and a stream key, right? So those are essential if you're going into somebody else's encoder, you're going to a TriCaster or, or sort of any device, and say, hey. Here it is, right? It's um, here's the key I want you to put in. Now we're going to receive that feed into the router just like any other source. Once it's in the router, now we have the control of: do we take it to SDI? Do we take it to NDI? You know, how do we plug this piece out there um, and go down that path? Uh, in addition to that, I can also scour the local network and I can look for NDI feeds and then pull in the NDI feeds. Um, that are local to my system and then use the encoder to publish that back out um, as a pull feed, as an SRT, as a uh, BRT, whatever we want to do. So we get some flexibility in how we use the content that's available to us at any given time. Yeah. Um, and the direct router rack uh, or direct router studio, uh, we can uh, fit that with, it comes with just six IP inputs as a standard. But then you can uh, fit that with uh, SDI or NDI inputs, SDI, NDI outputs, and so on, and net video inputs. So you're kind of, kind of creating the system that your workflow requires. Uh, what kind of uh, needs do you have uh, to, to create uh, the best possible solution for you? Yeah, no, that's that's absolutely key from that perspective is is building it the way you want to do workflow. So ordinarily, so a couple of ways we talk about this. There is a document um, that we've got available in the handouts that talks about the direct router. There's a couple of slides that you know, were floating around out there. But effectively, with the direct router tied to a TriCast or any kind of production system, you would have the router there to be able to receive a feed from an SRT device, from an, a, you know any kind of encoder out there, one of our encoders, um, another switcher, uh, VLC, whatever can produce a stream, we can now pull that in and then bring that in to your production switcher over NDI, over um, you know TCP, you're using a standard UDP or one of those, and then of course um, uh, SRT or if your switcher uh, enables it, SDI, which yes, yeah, still people are still using SDI out there. So we've got that ability to take a feed in, flip it over, and produce whatever we want out of it. Um, you know, and yeah, kind of bring and that in. Especially, especially in these times when a lot of people are trying to to receive and uh, to receive streams from uh, people staying at home, um, doing interviews on their phones or whatever. Uh, we've seen, uh, I don't know how many posts I've seen on, on LinkedIn with people creating uh, garage studios um, using, um, every kind of uh, equipment they have at home, laptops and so on, to to kind of get everything into their production environment and then output that signal um, into a second equipment to be able to stream that. So like we said, uh, it's the Swedish army knife of routers. So you can receive output, input and encode everything in one box. Now, Daniel, one of your feeds that we were just switching through is coming from your phone using what application? Uh, it's called Larix. Uh, I actually turned it off because I think that w was uh, kind of uh, breaking down my internet from here, uh, or at least my laptop's internet. Uh, so, uh, 
but uh, yeah uh, we've uh, we kind of scoured the internet to find a a good app that wasn't expensive that wasn't connected to any cloud services or whatever so we found an app um from yeah someone uh, probably a garage company that created a really nice app called Larix L A R I X um that can send RTMP and SRT um yeah so it's a free app um you can just download it you add your SRT or uh, RTMP destination and then you're good to go uh, so yeah that was that's actually really good so a big recommendation from our part <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so and just to recap from like this this particular rig that we're currently in, we've got oh, let's bounce out and look at it kind of up full. We've got SDI inputs, SDI outputs, NDI inputs, NDI outputs, RTMP, TCP, UDP, SRT. Like you said earlier, full Swiss Army knife, right? Anything in, anything out, all in a single one or two RU form factor. Um, and then, you know, I do want to talk about this little guy here. Uh, we've got, let's bring that one. Actually, let's go to the other shot so you can see it up close. Uh, focus, Danielson, focus. Okay, there it is. So this is the NDI mini router light, right? I mean, or, or router light, as you guys call it. So it is a super small form factor, two IP inputs, or, or two, I'd say, um, network inputs, an HDMI output, an NDI output, right? So this gives the ability to, have a small box maybe at a receive location where a client doesn't want to deal with software, they want a more traditional monitor, plug this in, you can remote into that box, decide exactly what they're going to see, and then um, put that up on their screen, or they can output NDI, and so it's a small NDI receiver on the far side with error correction and all the other pieces that we talk about. Yeah. Okay, last one. Daniel, do we want to talk about the cloud yet? Or is that is that uh, a thing we're going to save for another day? Um, well, we could, uh, we, ha we are starting to um, put I put him on the spot on that one thing. He's, he's yeah. stopping right now. He doesn't know if he wants to talk about it. There, there is a cloud story coming around this product line. Right now, most of our clients are really looking at the on-prem side of it and how they solve using utilizing the the fewest but it's a point that i wanted to make on this one is none of the data traffic is flowing through a cloud provider so it's not bouncing through a cloud service we're going point to point hence the comment that all uh, uh, over his shoulder maybe head to one side a little bit is we are direct right it's all about the fact that it's point to point rather than point to cloud back um and so that's what cuts down the latency and allows the you know the fastest traffic flow so to speak for the data um, you know, and the ease of use. And so when you yeah. get into the interface, you always notice that you see the internal IP address and the external IP address, because that's how they're finding each other across the web, um, so to speak. Yeah, and, okay. and for, for us, it's it's always been, we've always been working with point-to-point uh, -point transmissions. And we, uh, Roland, when he started the company, started with distribution, uh, cable TV, and so on. So uh, we've always liked, the uh, to have hardware on on each side uh, and we still do and we think that having that uh, and and having everything in your own hands um, and being able to to uh, be as flexible as possible with with your own hardware but for events and and um, being more global um, it does add value for for events and so on to actually actually put the direct router in the cloud so we have two customers um, that are trying it out right now we're both uh, trying out aws and uh, and google so um, we will uh, keep you guys posted on what's happening but uh, um, it looks good nice and yeah and that's important right? it's about the flexibility one thing i guess we'll bring into that part of the conversation is being on-prem means there are no monthly fees with this either. So this is something that you buy and own. Um, there are support and maintenance contracts, but there's no monthly data fees. There's no data caps. Um, there's no cloud fees that come with this at this time because you're, again, using that direct internet connection, not going across the, uh, you know, through somebody's cloud service. Um, 
that's a very important one to talk about. Okay, in terms of demos, in terms of seeing this, we can absolutely set you folks up if you want to see this in person. We have a couple demo units that are floating around right now. A few of them are out with some providers who are testing out workflows, but we always keep a couple units um, available. We also are able to um, produce uh, a stream for your clients to view, right? So if we want to push a feed out or pull a feed from a client and show them, you know, bounce back to them, let us know. Um, we can absolutely set that up. Daniel and I will be available anytime. Um, ooh, Laura says we have questions. Uh, let's see. Um, oh, okay. Uh, here's a great one. Can you confirm the difference between router and receiver that the receiver has only SDI outputs or the router can have SDI and network outputs? Uh, spot on. And the so the receiver, when you go online, you look at the uh, or you know, look at the PowerPoint. There were three colors or three versions of the product. So there was green, there was black, and there was blue. Um, the uh, black one is a transmit only, right? It's going to take encode and send a feed out. It's the true direct link. The blue one is the router, which can both receive and transmit back out. And the green one is a receive only. So it's going to take a feed and pop it over to SDI. Daniel, is it doing NDI output on the um, receivers yet, uh, or is it still just SDI only? Just SDI. Uh, and it SDI. doesn't even have, it's what, uh, if you receive on IP input one, you have it on SDI output one. So it's the very simple receiver. Uh, it can receive uh, a lot of different formats, but it's still IP input, SDI output. Uh, Laura, uh, bounce those questions back to me. You just took them away. I missed them. The other me, sorry. Can I raise my hand so you know? Sorry, guys, I got two machines open and there was a question from Brian Rose. There it is, it's back. Okay, can you take feeds from Jitsi sources? They're basically RTSPs. So Jitsi is using WebRTC um, from that perspective. So yes, uh, effectively. Daniel, I don't know if you looked at that one yet. Jitsi is an open source product that just got bought by, um, Scott found this out for me, just got bought by uh, 8x8, um, which is an audio conferencing company. Um, and so Jitsi is where you can kind of roll your own. It's been the source code that a lot of people plugged into their products to create a WebRTC feed that you can pull in. Uh, effectively, WebRTC is a specific standard, but yes, you would be able to pull a WebRTC um, because it, you're right, it's, um, uh, Brian, it's basically an RTSP feed. Um, so no problem there sourcing content from a product like that. Again, if it's an IP source and we can give it a key or we can give it an IP address, we can scrape it. Uh, we actually just did a really interesting test, Daniel, I don't know if you want to talk about this one yet, with um, a sports provider that was pulling an SRT feed through High Vision's SRT cloud. Uh, yep. And it would have took you guys uh, a day or two days to you know make it work. I don't even know, I mean, it was fast. 30 minutes? Yeah, yeah 30 minutes. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and the difference is what, what we figured out with the High Vision side of it was High Vision obfuscates the IP address to a URL with a stream key. And so it was a slightly different approach to how you would scrape an SRT feed through the High Vision cloud. But any camera that generates an SRT feed is very easy because it's just, um, we're just going to be pushing it directly to the router via an IP address. Um, makes it super, super easy. So, Mr. Rose, I hope you see that one. Um, let's see. Don't forget to plug in your MacBook. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yes, I, uh, that one's toast already, whoever. Um, Mr. Miller, thank you for noticing that my MacBook was running low. Um, okay, here we go. Do feeds or sources have to be synchronized to be used in the built-in switcher, or can you frame sync internally? Ooh, Daniel. Um, we, right now, we don't have any uh, system for uh, frame sync on incoming stream from uh, different encoders uh, uh, or from different devices. Uh, so you can't, uh, yeah, we don't have a specific function for, for frame sync in different inputs. Uh, but if we're using, for example, if you have a direct link, you can have four SDI inputs or eight SDI inputs and you're using <coughs> Um, eight software encoders and actually sending eight different cameras. Um, you can use our own protocol or SRT or whatever and set all your, um, use all the settings uh, in the same way. Uh, so when we've, uh, we ran tests with uh, Bifrost for a couple of weeks 
and the most we've seen it glitch was about uh, two frames. Um, so uh, we don't have a specific frame sync from different input uh, feature yet. Uh, we are working on it, but uh, yeah, using BRT using from the same imp from the same device uh, over the same network, we have a good we have a good enough solution for it. It's not lip sync, but it's still pretty good. Yeah, and then um, Brian, in addition to that, when you talk about uh, video resolutions and frame rates supported, so all the standard broadcast uh, frame rates and resolutions, so HD 720, 1080, 1080p, um, both the European PAL side and the US-based versions, um, all those are supported. Um, so it's it's going to fit right into your standard broadcast workflow in terms of uh, frame rates and resolutions, no issues there. And then in terms of utilizing different um, different frame rates or different you know formats in the video switcher, you'll set the video switcher output, whatever it's going into your encoder is going to be the determining factor on that. So if you're outputting that to a multi-viewer, if you're outputting that to an encoder or out the whatever the spigot you're outputting that to, be it SDI, NDI, that's going to be the deciding factor on the encode side of what that looks like. And we do have support for 4K as well. That's true, there is 4K support. Um, okay, so Intenor is a hardware solution or is there a SaaS subscription model um, component of their offering? So it is a pure hardware solution as of this time. Um, so it's a it's a box, a couple of boxes that you buy or a single box spinning and how you wanna use it that racks up and that's how you, uh, that's how the application works. It is um, not a SaaS product at this time. Uh, yeah. You're, you're, gonna, you're gonna beat me for that one later, I know. Um, <laughs> Does the router support uh, SMPTE 2110 outputs? Um, so that is, uh, I'm gonna kick that one over to you. Yeah, uh, not right now. Uh, it's on the roadmap for December 2020. Um, we have uh, a couple of customers that actually um, already bought it uh, and are, are waiting on it. Uh, but since their facilities um, weren't uh, or aren't ready yet, uh, they, uh, we haven't prioritized it. Um, uh, but for, yeah, like I said, roadmap for December, 2020. It can't be prioritized if you pay up front. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no. <laughs> and then, you know, are you going to, are you looking at doing that on a card, um, the way you do the output cards, the SDI ones now, or are you guys thinking it's gonna be pure software going out of, you know, 10 gig or 40 gig port? Uh, I actually don't know. <laughs> Good that's the, that's the that's the honest truth um since uh, we've started to do some some testing with it i know our cto is is uh, looking at it but uh, uh, we don't have it in hardware yet so uh, he haven't he, yeah he i haven't started to test it yet at least uh, or we haven't started come that far in uh, in the, the development. So uh, I have to get back to you on that. So uh, Dana, we had a question for PTZ control if you're using the VPN. How does yep. that operate? It's, it's, I'm assuming it's not done through our application, but it's done through just the web GUI or whatever the GUI is for that camera. Would you speak to that briefly? Um, yeah, so uh, each unit has uh, dual Ethernet ports, so we just um, you connect that, uh, you're kind of connecting your other uh, Ethernet port on the unit to be able to communicate to that P2Z camera. Uh, so it kind of depends on, on which supplier uh, it is, uh, but for uh, Panasonic PTZ, it's, uh, uh, you can use their web GUI uh, and connect that through through the unit. Uh, a little bit same there, uh, P uh, VPN and so on is, is brand new for us. Uh, we have a couple of customers using it, but not one of my customers. So I haven't actually uh, tried it out that much. So uh, if you have questions about it, I, I'm happy to uh, yeah, send me an email. Uh, I'll get some more information from someone who has actually played around with it. Yeah, let's yeah let's take care of that. I think I already hit you with that email. Um, yeah, you know, that was from Mr. Jamie. 
Um, what resolutions are supported? Uh, Borden, this goes back to earlier. It's all the standard broadcast inputs and outputs. Um, you have enough for us, uh, all the way up to 4K, um, depending on which unit. Not all units support 4K, um, but it will absolutely take them. Um, yeah, and, and since, since uh, we are doing uh, software encoding on our hardware, uh, so a lot of it depends on which hardware you get. So if you get our 2U um, rack system, you have dual CPUs. Uh, so with that, you can get up to 4K. Uh, but if you use our 1U system, um, you're not going to be able to, to achieve that. So uh, same there, depending on what kind of uh, needs you have, uh, we will recommend different hardwares as well, as well as different softwares. Easy, easy. Uh, Daniel, can you talk about um, pr a production switcher or control interface? I think you guys have done some work with Scarhoy, if I recall. Uh, yeah, um, we can uh, uh, we can uh, implement uh, over the the uh, API. Um, uh, so the uh, net destroyer I was talking about before is actually uh, Scarhoy. Um, so uh, we have that Scarhoy connected to um, our direct router and connected to a laptop that are uh, running a Python script uh, that are creating this. Um, so, and we're all, uh, you all saw the video mixer. Uh, right now we're um, adding support for Stream Deck. Uh, so we will have native support built in um, within uh, on the direct link. So you can use, uh, just plug in a stream deck without uh, having to write your own macros and so on. Um, but um, yeah. Cool, so uh, Mr. Pearson, I hope that answers the question for you. If not, uh, buzz us and we'll. Um, uh, Mr. Borden would like to know, Daniel, why you do not have a beer on near you the way I have one near me. Um, so let's see oh, yeah. do that. Is yours off camera? Yeah. Okay. I need to. Uh, it's, it's well past <laughs> over your thirty where you're at, so. Exactly. It's uh, it's nine o'clock here, so. Awesome, awesome. Um, okay, so NDI in, NDI out. Um, it, we're I'm curious about an example of a latency. So going from US to Europe. So let's talk about end-to-end -end latency in general. What does that look like? Yeah. So um, I would say that. Uh, I mentioned that we are working on going sub 0 0.5 seconds, um, but that's kind of making our own encoding faster because uh, that is adding the latency right now and uh, with the perfect conditions over public internet, um, we are now down to 0 0.8, 0 0.9 seconds, um, but we wanna be at 0 0.4, 0 0.5. Uh, but if you want to add forward error correction, you want to add ARQ with resending, and then you're going to be at two seconds uh, or one and a half. Uh, so it all depends on how does the network capabilities look like? Uh, what kind of latency spikes are you seeing on your network? So what Nick showed you earlier with uh, the the graph uh, the graph actually shows you if you have packet loss if you have any latency spikes you can uh, you can put up historical data from the last 10 minutes to see am I experiencing any latency spikes so if you're on a remote location uh, and you're sitting home and your your MCR trying to figure out why do I have a blocky picture or why do I have um, a bad picture where even though i have low latency you can you can go in there and see what is causing this um and and that's the most important part for us uh is to help the customer to be able to troubleshoot this so you can see because a lot of uh, the uh, what's adding latency is what is happening on the public internet um so 
glass to glass, 0 0.8, 0 0.9 seconds uh, in the perfect world. But since we're out and about uh, using 4G and maybe Wi-Fi and so on, um, then we will. Uh, then you need to add more latency, and the system will handle this um, for you. Uh, or you can use do your own manual settings. I don't think it, I don't know if that was a good answer, but maybe an explanation about how we look at it. Uh, Daniel, does Brightfast use HEVC? Uh, we can. Uh, since a lot of our customers are doing uh, web, uh, we don't really see the, the purpose in using HEVC. Uh, we have support for it, uh, but uh, yeah, uh, that that's pretty much the, the answer I usually uh, give. Uh, because also that since we are doing software encoding, our encoding is really, really good uh, in H.264. Uh, we've been working on it a lot. That's one of the main reasons why all these esports companies are using us is because our H.264 encoding is so good that, um, yeah, we... Um, we can really tap ourselves on the shoulders and uh, say that that's probably one of the best um, H.264 software encoding uh, out there. Uh, and with that, uh, we actually get as good um, quality as we do with H.264 in the same, or HEVC uh, in the same bitrate. Uh, and even though if we uh, lower the bitrate and get maybe the same uh, quality, we need to transcode it because the customer wants to send this material to Twitch or Facebook or whatever. Uh, and adding that layer of transcoding will lose quality. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, also, a little gonna, bit talk around it. Brian, but... I'm, Mr. Duval, I'm going to come back to your question in a minute, but um, Kurt Miller, I'm going to knock yours out first. So, does Intenor see itself as competition to LiveView or as complementary product or both? And I'm going to go with the latter, the, the the last one, which is both. In in many ways, there are things that can be done here that you can't do with LiveView. In many ways, um, we can complement a LiveView system by bringing it in and giving you more flexibility with the output, right? Um, commonly, we hear from people that you know they want to you know, use their LiveView system bidirectionally, meaning send it to two destinations at once, or have a remote viewer in one location and a, a pull feed in the other. And uh, you, you've got to buy a lot more from LiveView to pull that off or use their cloud service, which then adds latency, right? So with Intenor, um, we can absolutely scrape a live view and be complementary to it to give it more features, or we can completely replace it in some environments. There is a small backpack version of the direct encoder and direct router. So if you want to have something portable with up to eight bonded cellular to uh, Wi-Fi and to Ethernet, that can be done in a box that's available now. Um, and it can be put on a backpack or it can be set in a flat pack and run around with it. So there's a lot of things that we can do um, that I think they can't do with their product um, that gives us some flexibility. But absolutely, if you've got a client that loves their live view, um, you know, adding this to that environment will only make that environment better. Yeah, um, I like that answer. It, yeah, <laughs> you do. And then what's yeah. the best use for remying live sports production? So I'm uh, Brian, I'm a... Uh, I'm not, I guess I got to think about this, like the best use for, um, I mean, I, honestly, like we've seen some some different examples. Esports is a really big one, right? Where you've got multiple tournaments happening in different locations or live players happening. So they have a version of the Intenor encoder that's a small PC form factor tower designed to be quieter that the esports players are outputting their system into to meet Twitch specifications and to generate a feedback into a master control environment. So, you know, an environment like esports where you've got, again, all these players in different locations and you want to pull them into one and be able to produce that feed and broadcast it, um, that's a great application. 
being able to do um, sports production from different locations or you know different places on the field and not bring your TriCaster with you. Uh, we had a great talk with uh, LPGA or PGA last year, which was sort of the same conversation. With a product like this, you wouldn't have to bring the TriCaster to the field. You would leave it back in the control room and just bring your cameras and a few encoders. So, and then of course, you know, uh, remote viewing, remote, um, you know, uh, monitoring of signals and traffic. We have a uh, you know, some clients that are looking at ways they can do live television production, right, and be able to monitor that happening, you know, in the field or, or in the in the studio and then be able to monitor it. So there are so many different uses for Remy. Uh, I don't know that I could nail one down for you, um, you know, as a best yeah, use. But what is like, your plan? We, we, we talked about uh, cutting cost and cutting down on uh, uh, on travels. Uh, so there, there's a lot of, I think also, uh, to do more, uh, live streaming. Um, let's say I had uh, the triathlon union as one of, of our references. So they've been doing, uh, the international triathlon union has been doing live streaming for, for a couple of years, but it's always just the world tour series, the, the high end stuff. Uh, and for the high-end stuff, they have helicopters, they have satellite, they have uh, like the the big production OB vans going out. But um, then they got more and more questions about why can't we see the World Cup? It's still the some of the highest levels, a lot of uh, qualification rounds, especially last year for for the Olympic qualifications. Um, and we said that, well, why don't you try? They are actually using our our backpack, so they're uh, going around with three diff, uh, three and four uh, backpacks with eight SIM cards, um, and uh, traveling on motorcycles and following the the triathlon. Um, all these feeds are being sent back to Sweden uh, to a MCR uh, there and being produced um, and broadcasts on the triathlon live and this for uh like a tenth of the cost of uh, the the full uh, world tour series and uh, they still get a lot of good content they get the the competitors get um yeah nice content to to their friends and family and and fans and uh, they can offer their sponsors more content uh, to be shown. Uh, so there's a uh, there's a yeah. great case study on your website too, talking about the horse racing and how they took the commentators and stopped flying them in, but left them in their hometowns and allowed them to do their commentary remote. And how much money it yeah. saved them on production, on flights, um, and just the total way of life for these commentators to have a better, not be jumping on a plane on a weekly basis, but being able to you know stay in their hometown, have dinner with their family more often. Exactly. Yeah, Which so German totes. Right yeah, German totes. Uh, so PMU, um, the French horse racing company, uh, owns the German horse racing company. So they want to, uh, and they want to have French commentators on the German races and German on the, the French, and they want to have, it's the same commentators on all the, the races and so on. So instead of flying them all over both France and Germany, uh, they put up studios uh, in their hometowns uh, or in their living rooms or in their home offices and they're, you're, they are just sending back the commentator feed uh, to a studio in Paris and then they're distributing everything from there. So yes. cutting cost, I think, I think they saved the hardware cost in like a month or something uh, nice. uh, compared to all the travels they did before. Uh, Art Aldridge had a good question. So it's talking about how many feeds can go through one encoder. So let's take that part first, which is uh, the standard encoder comes with two SDI inputs, but one encoder, and then you can add a second software encoder to it, making it a dual channel system. Uh, we can add additional cards to that, making it up to a quad channel system. And then when you get into the uh, 2RU version, it can go, what's six, eight? What's the top level test that's been done? At this uh, point? Eight. Eight. So eight yep. channels in that one. And then he was asking specifically about PTZ control within that. By some, um, so how many PTZ cameras um, you know, would you be able to control within that environment? I actually need to, to get back to you on that. Uh, to be honest, I have no idea. 
Okay. So yeah, we'll do that. my assumption is being that they're all IP, they would each have their different address. Um, so we can do it. But Art, we'll get that one for you and get it back. Yeah. Um, no, and, and, I will not discuss and, about. Sorry. <laughs> no, as I say, the next question was about pricing. Um, there is no one price fits all on this one. Uh, so ideally, is if you um, if you're one of our dealers, jump online, grab the latest price guide. The pricing for this is there, including some pre pre bundled kits. Um, it's easier to look at that than for me to try and spout off a bunch of prices on this call um, because I would probably be wrong. I'm not normally the pricing guy. Um, you know, so uh, reach out to one of your dealers or call um, our staff and get the pricing on that um, or we can work through your dealer with it. Uh, but yep, that's my answer to that. Um, all right, that looks like we've exhausted the questions momentarily. We've gone way over time. Daniel, we're way past your bedtime. Um, yep. so much obliged to you. Thank you for the time. I really appreciate it. I will say, as always, if you have questions, um, hit us up online. Uh, let's make sure we get the, whoop, whoop. Find the clear the right path there. There we go. Um, call the office at 415-256-2800. Uh, you can ask for me. Good luck um, if you want to get through. Um, Shai Sales at Jay Banda, ask any questions. Uh, Daniel will put your contact info in the show notes. You can reach out to Daniel as well. Questions, comments, demos, we are happy to support, um, but always make us your first call and we'll do the rest of the late work from there. Uh, Daniel, thank you so much for being here so late in the day. Thank you, Nick. Thanks. Greatly appreciate it. Any parting words of wisdom other than stay safe? <laughs> stay safe. Uh, and uh, yeah, hope to talk more about Intinor and uh, our, our solutions. Absolutely. All right. I'm going to leave the show with that. Thank you so much for joining us. Make sure you grab yourself a cup of coffee on the way out and a, and a nice you. breath if you've had too many. Appreciate it all. We'll catch you on the next show later this Thursday.